May the Lord richly bless you today, everyone. My name is Sina Patora, Dr. Diana Prathan of Jesus is Lord Fellowship Worldwide International. I am bringing you an amazing book of Colossians series this next week. Amen. And I am really excited about this. Amen. I am very, very excited about this. I wanted to welcome this 4th of July weekend. I wanted to welcome all of the national and all of the international visitors and members worldwide. Amen. I wanted to welcome each and every one to this Worldwide Ministries where Jesus is Lord, where you come to receive the written and the full word of God each brand new day. Amen. And where we bring the spirit of love, power and a sound mind. Um, the announcements for the week. Through the Lord's grace, uh, Deacon Matthew Helmich is doing a, a searching for the scriptures and it's going to resume on July 3rd. Glory to God. Um, also, Deacon Matthew at the moments with Deacon Matthew. That's another one of his teachings. It's going to resume July 7th. And our Bible studies, our GPA certification Bible studies, where you could come to receive the Word of God. Amen. Um, it's going to start in the book 12, chapter 12 in the book of Mark on the 3rd. Amen. This has been an amazing year so far in the book of Mark. Amen. And uh, various of you are are moving within it and sharing with me everything of what you're getting out of out of the book of Mark and also out of the previews that we post every week amen out of the book of Mark tithes and offerings in the book of Matthew chapter 1042 Jesus has promised us in Matthew 1042 and whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple assuredly I'll say to you he shall by no means lose his reward when you give unto Jesus' Lord Fellowship Worldwide International you give a virtual cup of cold water to tens of thousands daily how do you ask Pastor Diana by enabling Jesus' Lord Fellowship Worldwide International to daily satisfy your spiritual thirst in the virtual world of the internet. Amen. Where we minister to homes throughout the world. We also supply the needs by posts worldwide. Please consider sending us uh, regular tithes and offerings. May the Lord richly bless each and every one of you. We do pray that our fellowship does minister to you on Sundays and throughout the whole week on a daily basis. Amen. May the Lord, our God, richly bless you. Have the most blessed Jesus-filled day. We daily are available to assist each and every one of you each brand new day in every area of your life. In Christ Jesus, amen. Through Jesus' Lord Fellowship Worldwide International. My name is Sr. Patora, Dr. Diana Prevan. Where Jesus is Lord. Folks, let us take a moment. Right now. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Let us also remember in prayer. To pray for everyone that has breath within ourselves. Every prayer needs of everyone that you may have come across of this past week, this past month, or throughout. Amen. For every prayer needs in health, also in prosperity, also into the joy of the Lord, which is our strength of happiness. Amen. Also, for anyone who is facing any kind of chronic issue of any chronic battle that you don't even 
fathom or withstand that how that you're going to get pulled through this day with such a pain. Amen. As we pray, also let us hold up all of the prayer requests that we have received throughout this past week. Let us also be in agreement with every personal prayer request, amen, that lays deep within each of our hearts. Let us lift up all of those that have been called as prayer warriors worldwide, that they may have the Lord's strength as they pray, and that a hedge of protection may surround them and their family. Let us also pray for the needs of our local church, including the needs of Jesus as Lord Fellowship Worldwide International. Let us ask the Lord our God for every provision so that his church may be able to continue, continue the work that the Lord has aside, set aside for it. Let us pray for those that have been called to leadership in his church. That they may have strength and a godly vision at all times. Let us place a hedge of protection around every leader and every family member. So that they may be healed from all health situations. Let us pray as well that as we listen today, our heart and our inner soul will be open to the word so that we may feed freely upon the message and we may drink from the power of the Holy Spirit. We welcome today, folks, all of the national and all of the international fellowship members and visitors around the globe as you receive the spiritual nutrition of the Lord's Word. I know I did mention that, but I get so excited with each and every one of you. Amen. Um, may the Lord richly bless you today around the globe. I am Senior Patora of Jesus' Lord Fellowship Worldwide International, Dr. Diana Brevon. Let us prepare ourselves and let us open up your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Folks, there's one more announcement. This is July. My birthday month is July 22nd. You are welcome to send in um, cards or what your heart uh, leads you to send in this month um, to the P.O. Box 2752, Inverness, Florida, 34451. Amen? 34451. God bless each and every one of you, amen, for all of your beautiful cards, all of your beautiful letters, and every detail of, of every mail that you send in, amen. Um, also, your letters of encouragement for those who need encouragement as we send out the messages, as we send out devotions and everything to jails and to various areas, amen, of those who need the, the Lord's word. Amen. May the Lord richly bless you today around the globe. I am Senior Patora, Dr. Diana Brevon. I shared with you to please open up your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 23. Amen. Amen. The nature of the Lordship. The nature of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the prologue of the epistle. It climaxes with thanksgiving for the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, leading directly and logically into a discussion of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. This discussion forms the first major section of the body, teaching portion of the epistle, 
It examines the Lordship of Jesus Christ, describing his preeminence in both creation and redemption and his work of reconciliation. A preeminence of Jesus in chapter 1 verses 15 to 20 who is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of every creature for by him were all things created and are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions of principalities or powers all things were created by him and for him and he is before all things and by him all things consistent and he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence for it is pleased the father that in him should all fullness dwells and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven Colossians chapter 1 15 to 20 folks is one of the greatest proclamations of the doctrine of Jesus Christ in the brand new testament amen many commentators pointing to the rhythm of the passage here and the repetition of the of the key words it suggests that it was perhaps an early hymn its theme is the supremacy and all supremacy of Jesus Verse 15, the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. The word image is translation of the Greek elekon, E-I-E-L-K-O-N, elekon, from which we get the English word icon. Amen. Vine explained here, that the word involves the two ideas of representation and manifestation. Amen. In Colossians chapter 1 15, the image of the invisible God, it gives the additional thoughts suggested by the word invisible and that Christ is the visible representation and manifestation of God to created things beings okay to created beings many people today folks maintains that image and refers to an eternal destination okay it refers to an eternal distinction and relation in the Godhead that is one person called the Son is the eternal image of another person called the father but instead image relates to incarnation as the following points demonstrates number one the context which reveals that the subject of discussion is the incarnation colossians chapter 119 amen number two the and the antecedent amen the antecedent of the pronoun who is the son amen that's Colossians chapter 113 the title of son this designates the human person in whom God was incarnate who was born and who died in Luke chapter 135 Romans chapter 510 and Galatians chapter 4 4 I pray that everyone has their pens their notepads and their highlighters prepared today folks amen as everyone knows for you to receive the Word of God get your highlighters out get your notepads out get your 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 pens out 
especially just in case as we go along here today. Amen. Let me repeat with you again the, the books. Amen. Um, the title of son, which designates the human person and who God was incarnate, who was born and who died. Okay. The Bible verses is Luke chapter 135. Romans chapter 5 verse 10 Galatians chapter 4 4 Thus the image is a genuine human not a second divine spirit the prepositional phrase of the invisible God it qualifies image showing that the image under discussion is visible and therefore physical human number four the image is of God, the totality of the duty, the fullness of the invisible one, not merely the image of one of three divine persons. The other passages here also expresses this truth. The sun is the brightness of his, God's glory, and the express image of of this person in Hebrews chapter 1 3 amen no man have seen God at any time the only begotten son which is the bosom of the father he hath declared him John chapter 1 18 Christ is the image of God 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 and a finite Limited sense. All humans are images of God. Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 27. But Jesus is the image of God in a unique sense. For he is the perfect image of God. And in him dwells the fullness of duty. That's Colossians chapter 1, 19. A perfect representation is a manifestation or incarnation folks thus unlike other humans Jesus is the incarnation of God revealing God to the humanity first born where does the word first born come from amen where does the word firstborn come from the word firstborn it comes from the Greek word prototokos prototokos which is p-r-o t-o t-o-k-o-s prototokos amen Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6 Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6 uses the same Greek word they're translated first begotten amen the first begotten to describe Christ first born here it means to two things here amen the word first born here means two things here amen it means priority in time and it means supremacy in place or position. As God, Jesus was not born at all. As a man, he was born in Bethlehem after thousands of years of human history. Obviously, then the primarily meaning of firstborn here is supremacy over all creation, folks. It does not even mean that Jesus was actually born before all other humans. Both the New King James Version and the New International Version, this renders the phrases here as the firstborn over all creation. Amen? Many people here, they maintain that firstborn, which refers to an eternal relation between two divine persons. 
And that is one person called the Son is eternally being begotten by another person called the Father. According to Psalms chapter 2 verse 7, however, the Son was begotten on a specific day. And Hebrews chapter 1 5 to 6 links this verse with the title of the first begotten or firstborn. Moreover, we have already seen that the Son was human person in whom God was incarnate. Thus the begetting of the Son, this relates to the incarnation, not to an undefined incomprehensible eternal progress. No. Verse 16, this begins here to explain how and why Jesus is preeminent. First, he is the creator. The verse twice states that everything was created by him. The first occurrence here of by of by is the translation of the Greek preposition en, E-N, which literally means in. Amen, folks? The Bible clearly teaches that one solidary being who is God or Jehovah, the Lord, created the universe without assistance from anyone else. Amen. I want you to write down these passages. Amen. Isaiah 37, 16. Isaiah 44, 24. Isaiah 45, 18. Malachi chapter 2, 10. These passages such as John chapter 1 3, Colossians chapter 1 16, Hebrews chapter 1 10. This speaks of this speaks of Jesus. Amen. Ouch. This speaks of Jesus Christ. Ouch. Excuse me for one second here. The antecedent of the pronoun him in Colossians chapter 1 16 is son. In Colossians chapter 1 13, thus the son. Jesus Christ is the creator here. Okay? He was not yet the son. However, when he created the world, as we have already seen, the title of, of son here, this relates to the incarnation, to the man in whom God fully dwelt. This verse does not mean that Jesus Christ created the world as the son, as a human, but rather it means that the one who later became the son created the world. For example, that I'm going to share with you right now. When we say President Lincoln was born in Kentucky, we do not mean that he was president at the time of his birth. Amen? Rather, the one who later became president was born there. The creator is the eternal spirit of God who later incarnated himself in the Son and was manifested to us as Jesus Christ. Amen, folks? All things were created for him. The Greek pre preposition here is es, which E-I-S, meaning for unto. In other words, Jesus is the goal of creation. Interestingly, amen? Romans chapter 11, 36 and 1 Corinthians 8, 6, they are both used the same Greek preposition here to say that all creation is all creation to all creation or all creation in God the Father. Amen? Amen and amen. Verse 17 here underscores the teaching of, of, of the verses that, that we're sharing about today. Amen? It underscores it. In verse 15 to 16 that Christ Jesus is the source and the sustainer of creation. 
He is before all things as the one true God, the Spirit of Christ, the eternal pre-existent. Moreover, the Son, the foreordained Lamb, was first in the mind of God. All creation was pre predict ah, excuse me folks was predicted upon the incarnation and the atonement amen i get so excited with this as i teach you i guess you could hear that in my voice in your pastora's voice here significantly this verse it states he is instead of he was you hear the words folks Jesus is not merely a human. He is also the eternal. He is also the unchanging God. Hebrews 13.8 Yahweh Jehovah He is the unique name used to identify the true God in the Old Testament which comes from the third person singular form of the verb to be Meaning, he is. It's equivalent to the first person, singular form, that God used for himself. I am. The greatest I am. That's Exodus 3.14. In the New Testament, Jesus identified himself as, I am the God of Abraham. That is John chapter 8.58. Verse 18, Jesus is the head of the church. The inspiring, ruling, guiding, combining, sustaining power, the mainstream of, of its activity, the center of its unity, and the seat of its life. Amen? Huh. The church is Christ's body. Who is the church? Christ's body. We are the church, folks. Romans 12, 5. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and also verse 27. He is its head. Amen. Please uh, keep on following along with the scriptures and write down scriptures as we go along because we have various things to go over. Amen. Jesus has the preeminence, folks, in all things. Literally, he's holding first place as to his duty. Jesus has always been supreme. But by virtue of his human life, death, resurrection, and ascension, he conquered sin. He conquered death. He conquered hell and the devil and established the New Testament church. See Acts chapter 2, verses 32 to 36. And Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, 14. Hebrews chapter 9, 14 to 16. Revelations chapter 1, verse 18. He thus openly declared his lordship and earned the right to be called Lord. As to his glorified humanity, he's not only the king of eternity, but also the human Messiah and Savior. His resurrection proclaims his universal preeminence as the perfect man, the incarnate God. Jesus has the preeminence in all things. Literally, he's holding first place as to his duty. Jesus has always been supreme, folks. But by virtue of his human life, his death, his resurrection, and ascension, he conquered sin, death, hell, and the devil and established the brand new Testament church. See, if you will, also in Acts chapter 2, 32 to 36. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 9, 14 to 16. Revelations chapter 1, verse 18. He thus 
openly declared his lordship and earned the right and earned the right to be called Lord as his glorified humanity. Amen. He is not only the king of eternity, but also the human Messiah and savior. His resurrection proclaims his universal permanence as the perfect man, the incarnate God. In verse 19, can be translated in one of two ways. Either way, the fundamental meaning is the same. The Greek grammar of the verse, it supplies an explicit and personal subject, pan to, to pleroma, meaning the fullness. Using this in interpretation, the verse reads, All the fullness willed or was well pleased to dwell in him. And then Marshall's in, in interliner, Greek, English, Brand New Testament, this identifies the subject here as all the fullness, while the Revised Standard Version identifies it as the fullness. J.B. Phillips translated it as was in him that was full nature of God who chose to live. Folks, this option here, this seems likely because it means both in Colossians chapter 1, 19 and also chapter 2, verse 9 have the same subject in Greek. And then number two, I wanted to share with you. Alternatively, since this verb is personal, perhaps there's an implied personal subject here in the King James which supplies <clears throat> okay the King James ver um, version it supplies the father while the NIV version supplies God amen Kenneth Taylor he has uh, rendered it for God wanted all of himself to be in his son. Amen. That is the living Bible. Amen. Fullness from the Greek pleroma. Okay. P E L P L E R O M A. What does this Greek word mean? It means that Christ is not merely a representation, summary, or sketch as the image in verse 15. This could otherwise be interpreted, but the full revelation of God. Amen. Verse chapter, verse 20. The purpose of incarnation is atonement. The purpose of incarnation, it is atonement. God came in flesh to reconcile his fallen creation back to himself in the Knox. This translates that God came to win back all things into union with himself. In union with himself. Amen. Amen and amen. B, I wanted to share with you. Glory to God. I'm really excited about this. The reconciliation through Christ Jesus. Amen. The reconciliation of Christ Jesus that we read in, in uh, verses 21 to 23. And then let's read this again. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled and the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable. Uh, in his sight if ye continues and the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven whereof I Paul am made a minister these three verses folks it expounds upon the message of redemption and reconciliation which stated in verses 13 to 14 and also verse 20 
verse 21. God has reconciled the saints through the blood of Jesus. We need a reconciliation because we were alienated from God by our sins. We were actually his enemies. Why? Because we rebelled against his will. Amen. See Romans chapter 5 verse 10. Verse 22. The redemptive work of Jesus Christ. He abolished our alienation and his redemptive work. Depended upon the death of his physical body. The Gnostics here. It did not even believe in the reality of Christ's flesh. But this verse, this verse emphasizes the necessity of believing that he truly came in human flesh. Amen? Um, on your own timing, please also look at 1 John chapter 4, 2 to 3. Our salvation, folks, this depends upon it. And otherwise, we have no blood of atonement, no kinsman, redeemer. Amen. We don't have no kinsman, redeemer, no substitutionary sacrifice. Christ's physical body is the necessary link between incarnation and the atonement. The one who acts in verses 21 to 22 is the same one who acts in verses 20. God the NIV translates, okay? The NIV, it translates. He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death. The Phillips translation, it seems to recognize that both the pronouns he and him, it refers to God. You, he. God has now reconciled through the death of his body on the cross. Amen. The body of Christ is the very body of God. The use of, of the present. Here in, in verse 28. Here in verse 28. This underscores the reference to sanctification. The word speaks of our our presentation to Christ at his coming in Ephesians chapter 5 27 this states this point clearly that he Christ might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish amen verses 19 to 22 it reveals a strong link between the doctrines of oneness, the atonement, and holiness. The doctrine of oneness, the absolute oneness of God, and the absolute duty of Jesus Christ. This proclaims that God reconciles us to himself in Christ Jesus. The doctrine of the atonement explains how he does so. Through the death of Christ. And finally, God's work of reconciliation. This calls us to a life of holiness. So that we can walk in restored fellowship with the holy God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 to 16. Amen. Verse 23 reminds us that God will present us holy, blameless, and beyond reproach only. And if ye continues in the faith, the verb continue is present tense, indicating that we must remain in the faith. And if we expect to enjoy the final benefits, folks, it reveals a condition. If, the word if, this reveals a condition. The means or condition of receiving God's work of salvation is faith specifically continuing faith we must be grounded or established firmly settled or steadfast and not moved away or not being shifted the images that of building and the admonish uh, ad admonition is to remain firmly on the one 
foundation. Amen? The one foundation. The foundation is the hope of the gospel. Namely, the gospel message that brings salvation and the hope of eternal life that it generates. Similarly, verses 4 to 5, this states that Christians base their faith and love on their heavenly hope. Just like verse 6, verse 23. Amen? Just like verse 6, verse 23 states that the gospel has been preached to the Colossians and to everyone. Again, this statement is a figure of speech known as the hyperbole. The hyperbole, it stresses the universality of the gospel. The gospel's universal proclamation, folks, availability and application which serves as its credentials. Perhaps there's an implied contrast here to the heresy at Corinth. Amen? Which was apparently associated primarily with a local teacher. Amen? Paul, he identified himself as a minister or as a servant of the gospel. The switch here to the first person singular, this pronouns begins here. The personal reference forms a bridge to the next portion of the letter, which deals with the ministry of Paul. Amen? Amen, folks, and amen. Folks, I pray that you will be able to, to copy and paste the script of this Colossians series. Because we're going to be focusing on some amazing words and the meaning between Greek and, and our language within English, you know, our language that we speak in English, you know, every biblical meaning of every biblical word throughout the series. And it's amazing as you go along with it. So I pray that you could copy and paste and file from last week's sermon of, of the book of Colossians, of um, the script of Colossians, and also um, today's. Amen. Today's part two. We will be continuing the series. And it's amazing teaching. Amen. We will be continually going into the series. And it's amazing teachings. Amen. My name is Senior Pastora. Dr. Diana Brevan of Jesus is Lord Fellowship. Worldwide International. Now... Everyone knows that this is the first Sunday of the month. What do we do together every first Sunday of the month? We all gather together in the spirit of communion. Amen. Worldwide, no matter where you are, you are welcome always to join us in the spirit of communion. Amen. To receive your Holy Communion. Now, let us observe the Lord's Supper, folks. Let us observe the Lord's Supper. The Holy Communion, known also as the Lord's Supper, it represents the greatest expression of God's love for His people. Two items are used in the Holy Communion, which are the bread, which are the bread which represents Jesus' body. That was scourged and broken before and during his crucifixion. And the cup which represents his shed blood. Amen. When Jesus walked on earth, he was vibrant. And his body, it was full of life, folks. And health. He was never sick. But before Jesus went to the cross... He was so badly scourged by the Roman soldiers and his body was torn as he hung on the cross. At the cross, God also took all, all of our sicknesses and diseases and put them on Jesus. Originally, perfect and healthy body so that we can walk in divine health. 
That's why the Bible says, by his stripes, we are healed. Amen. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, and also 1 Peter 2, 24. In the book of Luke 22, 20, Jesus tells us that the cup is the brand new covenant in my blood. And the Apostle Paul tells us that the blood of Jesus brings forgiveness of sins. Amen. Colossians chapter 1 verse 14. Ephesians chapter 1 7. Why do believers partake of the Holy Communion? Besides being born again in Christ, a healthy body and mind are the greatest blessings, folks. Anyone can never have. And the Holy Communion is God's ordained channel of healing and wholeness. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus ate his last supper with his disciples and knowing what he would accomplish through his sacrifice. He instituted the Holy Communion. Amen. Luke chapter 22.